Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to begin uh, our study here. So let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful uh, for the message that we heard this morning and for uh, the way that you speak to us through your word. And we just invite your presence again, and that you can speak to us once more, that you can help us to understand the truths that you have given your people. And we just pray for your spirit to work upon our hearts, that we can be truly converted, and that we can do the work that you ask us to do. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we went through a detailed um, chronology of Ezra 7 to 10. And this is something, you know, that obviously came to this movement in 2013 with Emiliano noticing Ezra 7, 9, and that there was this significance of the first day of the fifth month. And it's going to be on August 31st, 2013 at Sylvan Lake. The Jeff's going to ask a question about this, and not as part of his study, but just, um, he just asks, you know, to the group, not during a meeting. And then I do the calculation and I figure out when the first day of the fifth month is in 1844. Because Jeff, Jeff is thinking that there is, you know, 30 days in a month, but there's on average 29 and a half. And so that was new information to him. And then we're going to have Noel studying this out. And in the summer of 2020, or not 2022, 20, in the summer, it's June 22nd, the camp meeting starts. So it's, it's going to be in the summer of 2014 that he's going to lay it out in a nice line, similar to what I have. He's going to count off each day so that you can clearly see where the first day of the fifth month is. Uh, so that visual representation he had was really important. Now, right now you're looking at um, Daniel 9, verse 25. that says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Now, we looked at this last time, and we understand that there is a three-step uh, process, the going forth of the commandment, uh, the return of the people. That's what the word restore is. It means shuv. It means to return, and the to build. And each one of these events are marked in that history, in that story of Ezra. That is, often when people are trying to find the start of the 70 weeks or the 2300 days, but mostly the 70 weeks. People have all different kinds of starts. Some people want to start it with Cyrus. Some people want to start it with Darius. Some people want to start it with Artaxerxes' first decree. Some want to do it with his second decree, depending on the chronology that they have and when they think Jesus was crucified. Now, of course, with the 2300 days, we would have to start it, um, you know, here. But But people try to start the 70 weeks, various places. And um, I've looked at all of these different views, uh, studied some of them in, in uh, painful detail, uh, trying to understand them. So, you know, we have, uh, for instance, um, Isaac Newton, he's going to start the 70 weeks with the second decree, but he's going to have a different chronology. He's going to have uh, the second decree begin in... Um, 454 BC. So there's, Can there's Usher. No. Well, Usher does too. So yes, Usher does. And, and I'm pretty sure that Isaac Newton does. So Usher does. So he's another one that does. You could be right. Maybe it's not Isaac Newton as well. But, but I, I thought Isaac Newton uses Usher's chronology. Yeah. So Usher has a chronology that's, that differs. So often we'll say Usher's chronology marks uh, the seventh year of Artaxerxes in 457 BC, but actually it marks it in 467 BC, 10 years earlier. So then Usher is going to count uh, from 454, which is the second decree, but the second decree is actually in 444. And so, so Usher then is going to have the, the 70th week end in what, 36 or 37 AD, right? Something like that, Stephen? Um, Something like that. 
because he's going to have the midst of the week um, as being uh, a 33. So I think it's going to be 36. That is the end of the 70th week. Right. So, so anyway, the point is there's lots of different um, ways in which people try to understand this. The main point that I'm trying to bring out here is that only Artaxerxes first decree describes it is described in the scripture in a way that can be interpreted in these three steps, the going forth of the commandment, the return of the people and the to build. Right. If you look at Cyrus's decree, that that's often tempting because that's going to be the one that deals with the building of the temple itself. There is nothing in in the 70 weeks that talks about the building of the temple. It talks about the destruction of the temple, but not about the building of it. Right. So the 70 weeks is not commencing with um, Cyrus's decree. And, and obviously Darius's decree, some people try to put it there because that's when the temple is finished and they believe for some reason that the 70 weeks has to do with the completion of the temple. But again, it doesn't. Now, some people like the second decree of Artaxerxes. So, so they, they rejected the first three decrees. And, and one of the reasons is uh, because it talks about the building of the streets and walls. And that's going to happen in part of Xerxes second decree. But if you, if you understand how that sentence is put together, it's going to talk about the buildings of the streets and walls, even in troublous times, but that's not going to be the, and, and some people try to put that as the end of the 70 or the seven weeks. Um, but that doesn't happen at the end of the seven weeks. So, so there's all different kinds of. Of, of ways that people try to interpret this prophecy. Um, so this year, the going forth of the commandment happens in that period from the first day of the first month to the 12th day of the first month, right? You know, I mean, probably the 12th day of the first month would be the going forth of the commandment. But you, you couldn't say it has nothing to do with the first day of the first month, but, but they are connected. Uh, the return is obviously when they return to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. Now, the to build, we, we looked at this 20th day of the ninth month. So it's during this time that Ezra sets up the magistrates and judges and puts into effect uh, the civil authority that he's going to utilize three days before the 20th day of the ninth month. So the three-day periods we looked at last week, and we can see that the center of that is the 10th day of the seventh month. And then we also mentioned, of course, there is uh, the first day of the 10th month and the first day of the first month for the divorce proceedings to occur. And, and that becomes really important, that period of 88 days. And we're going to look at that, not today. What, what we want to look at today, and, I, and I've, I've tried to figure out how do I present this? So one of the things that I've said is that when we're going through this, the symbolic use of numbers, we're looking at this in the way that these truths unfolded to us. And the reason we do that is that somebody looking at the finished product, product of how we understand all of this different chronology might assume that we, we actually created a chronology to fit some ideas that we had. But in reality, I mean, we worked out the chronology and then all of these other things progressively unfolded from the study of chronology. Now, in, in the movement, we, we end up in, in 2013, first recognizing Ezra 7-9, but it's going to take, it's going to take over a year until this movement understands the first day of the fifth month. That is it in Millerite history. So what we really need to look at now is the connection between uh, the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month in Millerite history and the significance of it. Well, I'll look at this one with Samuel Snow's letters, but we're just going to have to ignore some of it right now. Um, so in 1844, you can see the first day of the first month in here. So this is, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that people can see it. So we can see the first day of the first month is April 19th. Now in the movements uh, prior to 2014, we don't recognize when the first day of the first month is. So when did we think the first day of the first month was in this movement? 
like in 2013, 2012? What date did we have for the first disappointment? Anybody know? It was uh, the 21st of March. Yeah. Now, now, why was it the 21st of March? Spring. What, what, what's that? Uh, because it was spring. Okay, it's the spring, but, but, but why did they choose the spring? Why did they choose the spring equinox for? The beginning of the religious calendar. Yeah, but it's not. Oh, it's the other way around? No, it's just that they didn't understand how the calendars worked. Oh, they were off on their calculation. But the reason was they were thinking of, of it being the first day in the religious calendar? Yeah. So, so William Miller, when, when we, when he made the, when they made the 1843 chart in 1842, and they put 1843 on the chart, they were actually counting the year 1843 from January 1st, 1843 to December 31st, 1843. Right? That's how they, they understood the, the year. Right? They, they didn't try to put it into a biblical year, which I find odd, but, but they said, you know, about the year 1843, and then when they put it on the chart, they were actually thinking January 1st to December 31st. Now, in, at the end in, in December of 1842, so they had made the chart back in the summer, in May or June, William Miller's going to write that he believes that the Jewish year 1843 should be recognized as the time when Christ is going to return. And so he says it's going to be from the spring, from March 21st, 1843, to March 21st, 1844. Now, he just had this mistaken belief that that it was going to be the spring equinox that started the year. He, he didn't understand how the calendar worked. And so once once they had, had made the chart and they started looking they started to refine their dates. They started looking at how the calendar worked. So as time went on, they recognized that March 21st wasn't going to be the start of the year. Now, it is interesting that the Jews did begin the year on March 21st in 1844. That is, both the rabbinic Jews and the Karaite Jews began the year on March 21st because in 1844, the the sighting of the first visible crescent, which is going to start the year, is going to be the first visible crescent after the spring equinox. But for the Jews, um, the rabbinic Jews, they did uh, the sighting of the visible crescent or actually the Passover moon closest to the equinox. And so that was going to put the Passover as April 3rd. So, so the Passover is going to be the 14th day of the first month. Both the rabbinic Jews and the Karaite Jews observed April 3rd as the Passover in 1844. So, so some of these things, you know, people didn't have the internet back then and it wasn't really easy for them to find this information. They depended upon uh, books in libraries and, and they didn't have a lot of access to this material. Sometimes it would be material that they found quoted in somebody else's book um, and they had no way to confirm it. So what, what's going to happen with the Millerites? Uh, they're not going to use May 21st because they mistakenly have the belief that the, that the Karaite Jews always begin the year one month later than the rabbinic Jews. And they believe that happens every year. They think that it's going to be one month later. Now, they happened to get it right in 1844, because in 1844, uh, the first visible crescent after the after the spring equinox isn't going to be um, until uh, the evening of April 18th. Because the one that's seen on the 20th is actually uh, before the spring equinox. So you have to have the first visible crescent after the spring equinox. So. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but the thing is, one interesting uh, detail uh, regarding this is that every way mark that we have in the prophetic mirror, the 2520 prophetic mirror that is in 742 
in 6, uh, 742, 723, 677, 457, and then uh, 538, 1798, 1844, and 1863. In each of those years, the, the, the there, there's going to be a delay of the start of the year because within a day, the spring equinox and the sighting of the visible crescent. And the sighting of the visible crescent is going to happen slightly before the spring equinox within a day for each one of those eight dates on uh, the prophetic mirror. And that is extremely unlikely to have occurred by chance. So if you're going to pick randomly eight years and and have that occur, like you're dealing with, you know, billion to one odds that you could, that would, that would happen by chance. I can't remember what the number was, nine billion to one or something. I had some, some huge number that's very, very unlikely. So, um, and that happens in 1844. So that's one of the dates. So you're going to have, cause, cause the spring equinox, it could be, um, you know, halfway through a month. But in this case, it's going to be right at the start of a month and the year is going to be delayed. That is, if, if the, spring equinox had been or if the visible crescent had been sighted one day later then the year the year would have started one month earlier in each one of those cases right so i know that's it's a little bit confusing information but so anyway when we look at april 19th 1844 as seventh day adventists we should have known that it's going to be the 10th day of the seventh month. And if you just did a little bit of math, you could know that it's not going to be in March if October 22nd is the 10th day of the seventh month. In 1844, September 23rd was the date for the Day of Atonement for the rabbinic and Karaite Jews. So, so they had the Day of Atonement one month earlier uh, than the Adventists did. And the Adventists just got the correct date mistakenly. With, with not understanding actually how the calendars worked. So, which is, which is an interesting uh, fact. So, so we have April 19th. So that's the first day of the first month. Now we don't have a 12th day of the first month marked, but we do have the first day of the fifth month. So this was the truth that, uh, really opened up, uh, the symbolic use of numbers within this movement. So when we recognized that the first day of the fifth month was the date in which uh, the midnight cry was proclaimed at Exeter. We now had some connection between 457 BC and 1844 that had never been noticed. Now it is true that the, that the Millerites understood the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month in 457 BC, but they did not try to recognize the first day of the fifth month in 1844. They didn't, they didn't try to figure out when the Passover was. They didn't try to figure out when Pentecost was. They just simply were trying to figure out when um, the 10th day of the seventh month was going to be and the first day of the seventh month because they believed the first day of the seventh month would be a close of probation and then there would be 10 days and then Christ would return. That was generally the view held by the Millerites after Samuel Snow presented uh, the midnight cry. So, so we're going to find in, in our history, we have this, this connection. Now, so during this time, we're, we're studying, uh, this chronology. I'm studying this chronology. I'm looking at these, these dates, the first day of the fifth month. And we talked a bit about that. Uh, you know, we have, um, um, Aaron, Aaron dies on the first day of the fifth month. Is that correct? It's Aaron that dies. Right, Stephen? Anybody? Um, uh, yes, that's, uh, okay. actually on the, on the 15th of August. In the and it's Gregorian also calendar. In August? In the Gregorian calendar. On the Gregorian. Yeah. In, and, and that's going to be in, uh, 1490. 1494. Yeah, 1494. So, so roughly, you know, uh, seven months or so before 
uh, they cross the Jordan, right? Because fifth, um, fifth yeah, sixth, yeah. eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. Yeah. So well, thirteen. Thir- uh, yeah, eight months. I think it's eight months. Wait. Right. So six, seven, eight. Yeah. So you get to the first day of the. Yeah. So it's going to be eight months later that, um, and eight months and ten days later that they're going to cross the Jordan River because they cross on the tenth day of the first month. Okay. So, um, okay, so so we had that symbol, and, and then we saw that it was hidden in Ezekiel for, um, uh, I think it's Ezekiel 20, I always forget if it's 20, I know it's 20-something, Ezekiel 26, the prophecy against Tyre. So it says in the 11th year, in the first day of the month, it doesn't say which month, but it's going to be the fifth month because it's the month after the city was broken. No, the first day of the fifth month in 1494 BC is when Aaron dies. The first day of the fifth month. Right. And then uh, eight months and 10 days later, they're going to cross the Jordan River. OK, and it's going to be August 15th on the Gregorian calendar in uh, 1494 BC. Just to answer the question in the chat. So we end up with this first day of the fifth month. And at that time, we're not we're not really noticing anything else. We just notice that there is Exeter. And it's going to be in 2015, at the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016, that we're going to notice the fifth day of the fourth month, Boston. Now, I, I wrote a paper on uh, the midnight cry on August 15th, 1844. Now, now most Adventists know about Exeter, but they have it wrong. That is, they believe at Exeter that Samuel Snow rode up on a horse, and showed up at the meeting, and and then uh, presented the midnight cry. And it's not exactly how it happened. So, for for instance, he actually rode up on the horse in Boston on July 21st, the fifth day of the fourth month, and that's when he's going to present the midnight cry. Now. Uh, Loughborough conflates the two stories. So he believes that Samuel Snow uh, rode up on the horse in Exeter, but that it's in July. So he doesn't know that Exeter is in August. Um, so he takes this story of when the midnight cry was given, and he has Boston and Exeter mixed up. So he calls what happens at Boston, he calls it Exeter. Um, and and so this creates all kinds of confusion regarding this history. And Adventists don't sort it out, which I find kind of remarkable, but kind of not. So why is it that this movement notices these details that that Seventh-day Adventist scholars, people who deal with this history, even, uh, you know, if we look at the book called The Midnight Cry by Nichols, he doesn't notice this discrepancy. You know, Spalding doesn't notice it. Uh, why is it that this movement notices these details? Should we take it as significant that this movement has noticed something that Adventists have never noticed before? Yeah, I think uh, God is unsealing a lot of the uh, Adventist truths that were, were sort yeah. of based upon based upon sort of Maori history, but the seven thunders, the sealed up, whatever. And then there's additional light. You know, this mm-hmm. year, casket shines 10 times brighter. Yeah. At the end yeah. of the world. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. But it is the strongest evidence that this movement is of God and that we are unsealing and have unsealed the seven thunders. Right. All kinds of little details about Millerite history that you would think all of these Adventist scholars researching this should have noticed but they are blinded to it um, because God is not wanting it to be revealed. And and it can only be revealed as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. That is, as this movement is going through these events, we have the seven thunders unsealed. And, and, And so if we were trying to argue that God has not been leading this movement in this chronology that we have, then, then this movement is not of God in any way whatsoever. 
You can't really have it both ways. Either this movement is of God, and what we have seen in Millerite history is, is really the strongest evidence that it is of God. But you can't say, well, all this chronology is wrong. We, we just got it wrong. Uh, it's, it's impossible for that to be the case. So, so we have these, these truths being unfold. The first day of the fifth month and the first day of the first month. Nobody else had ever marked the first day of the fifth month as August 15th at Exeter. But we also start to notice that people like Joseph Bates, uh, you know, he marks the giving of the midnight cry, the events uh, that that um, are placed at Exeter. He actually puts them in Boston. He also knows about Exeter as well. So Joseph Bates recognizes both of these. James White is going to be there at Exeter, and he's going to give an account which has nothing about Samuel Snow riding up on a horse, which only makes sense in the Boston account, because uh, they're already teaching the midnight cry in August. Now, it is true that, you know, um, uh, we're going to have uh, Joseph Bates uh, doing giving a sermon there in Exeter, and then you're going to have uh, him call up uh, Samuel Snow uh or to let him speak up about what he's going to present, what he, what his message is. And that is going to be presented in three studies the next day. So, and that next day is August 15th. So he's going to present the midnight cry on August 15th. So, so there's a lot of things about, about this. And, and I'm, I'm not going into detail right now. You can look at my paper on my uh, academia site uh, dealing with August 15th, uh, the midnight cry. And, and it's going to give you a lot of detail. But this is something this movement comes to understand. We have come to understand that there is this point that is midway between the first day of the first month and the 10th day of the seventh month. And that, and that is a chiasm, right? So the center is obviously an important point within a chiasm. And at Boston, Samuel Snow is going to ride his horse all morning. He's going to get to the Sunday service and he's going to give a short message regarding uh, how long is it? How long have we been in the tarrying time? You know, and, and he's going to first start with, you know, how long is a year in Bible, pro a day in Bible prophecy? It's a year. You know, how long is it till midnight? Right. It's going to be. Well, that would be. I'm trying to think how he words it. <clears throat> um. So that, that's going to be, um, yeah. So what I'm, I'm just going to read how he reads it. It's going to make more sense. I can't remember the exact words. You think I should be able to Let's see if I can find this quickly. Yeah. So he says, where are we in our Advent experience? The audience answers in the tearing time. How long was the, t the vision to tarry? His answer, the answer from the audience until midnight. What is a day in prophecy? The answer, a year. Then what would a night be? A night would be six months. Then what would midnight be? Three months. How long have we been in the tearing time? The answer is just three months. Now, now, uh, Lofro is then going to write. He said, then it is just the midnight now, and I'm here with the midnight cry. In a few sentences, he explained that it was the fall of 457, that the decree went forth. So they were short six months in their reckoning, showing them that the 2300 days would terminate October 22, 1844, instead of the spring as they had previously supposed. Then in a strong voice, he said, behold, the bridegroom cometh on the 10th day of the seventh month, October 22, 1844, go ye out to meet him. Now we know that Lothborough was not there and, and the account that he gives is not actually correct. So one is Samuel Snow never had to date October 22nd. He only had the 10th day of the seventh month. But we do know he presented something similar to this, right? That is, um, Lothborough is connect, uh, collecting accounts from others. And, and somehow he puts this at Exeter, even though it's at Boston, right? That this, this occurs. So this is the giving of, this is midnight. Midnight is midway between the first day of the first month and the 10th day of the seventh month. Now, 
We also have a symbol there, and we're going to look at that in more detail when we look at Ezekiel um, in more detail. But we know that Ezekiel begins on the fifth day of the fourth month. And, we're, and we've looked at Ezekiel already, but we're going to look at Ezekiel in connection with uh, the July 18, 2020 prediction uh, later. But he begins on the fifth day of the fourth month. And we know that the last vision that's listed in Ezekiel, not the last vision he has, but the last in the book, is on the 10th day of the seventh month. And in both of those dates, on the Julian calendar in, in those years, uh, July 21st, 592 BC, it's going to be the fifth day of the fourth month. And it's not every year that July 21 lines up with the fifth day of the fourth month. And then October 22 is when he's going to have his last vision about measuring the temple or the city, which is a symbol of judgment. It parallels with Revelation chapter 11. And um, you have the reed and you have the 1260 days and the 126 inch reed. And that's going to be the 10th day of the seventh month. So that means the book of Ezekiel starts at Boston and ends at the at the uh, the Day of Atonement in 1844. So Ezekiel is connected to Samuel Snow, right? Which is which is very interesting. He's also Ezekiel is also connected to uh, Josiah Lich's prophecy as well, but he's also connected to Samuel Snow. So that means Ezekiel is typifying that message of Samuel Snow. Oh, just a question. Yep. So you said that uh, Samuel Snow didn't specify the 22nd of October. Yeah. 1844. So yeah. do you know when that was specified? Who, on who did it? it? Well, yeah. So there was, there, some people wanted to have October 23rd and some people wanted to have October 22nd. And they actually waited until the beginning of October to confirm it based upon, uh, the sighting of the new moon. So it, it, they didn't have a specific date. Uh, I mean, some people said October 23rd, some said October 22. And you have to realize it's a pretty short time from the middle of August to October. So you got, you know, they got, you know, half of August, um, all of September, and then, um, you know, a bit more than half of October. So two months, basically, for them to, to come to that date. But all I'm saying is that he didn't have a date because he, he wasn't certain about it. And, um, I, and I don't think you can find in, um, in any of his writings. I don't think he has October 22 in his, definitely in his August 22nd of uh, the true midnight cry. He doesn't list the date. He just lists the 10th day of the seventh month. So that was left to other people to figure out. Samuel Snow doesn't do that calculation. But yeah, I think it's not going to be till the new moon in October that they, they settle on October 22. And now if they use the new moon in Jerusalem, uh, they would have had October 23rd. So there, there's a whole, whole study about that in the idea of that, that actually October 23rd is the correct date from Jerusalem. And so when Hiram Edson is in his cornfield and has the vision of Christ, that, that actually what he's witnessing is based on Jerusalem time because based upon the time he had in the morning that that would have been when the high priest is entering into the most holy place if if you were having the day of atonement in Jerusalem which is is a rather intriguing idea but but the millerites if you're using local time and this is an argument i make that um that god never intended Jerusalem uh for the world to be uh, the determining factor of when the feasts begin or the month begins, uh, that that would be local time that would uh, create that calendar. But but anyway, it, it, it's not a really important point, but it is an interesting detail that, um, you know, October 22 only works if you're uh, figuring out the calendar from from the United States. So. Um, just with the, the day beginning earlier in Jerusalem than in Boston, you would yeah. have maybe, what, maybe eight hours difference, roughly. Would it not be an earlier date than the 22nd of October? No? No, no you've got it backwards. 
So so what ends up happening is the new moon isn't going to be seen until one day later in Jerusalem. Okay, so actually, it's still not the new moon when it passes New Jerusalem, but then by the time it reaches Boston, the new moon has begun. Yes, yeah, it wouldn't be, yeah, you, you wouldn't see the new moon on the evening of the 12th if you were in Jerusalem, but you would see it on the evening of the 12th if you're in Boston, which makes the 13th the first day of the seventh month in Boston, but the 14th uh, the first day of the seventh month in Jerusalem. Right, okay, thanks. Yeah, and I just so, see- uh, some, Something I find interesting about that uh, detail occurs to me is, um, one of the verifications of it for me is that of the U.S. being a topic of Bible prophecy is oh, yeah. it God God mentions nations that directly affect His people, and uh, so Jerusalem is no longer in the picture in that sense. Yeah. So that's that is interesting. It's the U.S. that will affect God's people. Yeah, it, it is it is now the the promised land in that history. So you'll see here. See, this is Jerusalem. And, and you can see that the new moon isn't seen until October 13th in the evening, making October 14th the first day of the seventh month. And if you, um, um, and of course they say this is the eighth month because they're doing this. But if I go the day before, you'll see it's, it's, it's actually, you know, way down here in Jerusalem. So the moon is, is not visible. But if you go to Boston and you, if you could, I don't have a program that shows Boston, but if you go to Boston, the, the, the visible crescent, the crescent would be visible eight hours later when the sun, uh, sets in, in, uh, Boston. So it, it's, it's rather interesting detail. And as, as you're saying, Kelly, this is showing that, that the United States becomes the place of Bible prophecy. And there's a lot of other things about it as well. Uh, but but the idea that, that the, it's the local calendar, the local uh, new moon that is going to be uh, important in determining the Day of Atonement. So you you could argue that the, that the Adventists got it wrong by having October 22. Also, if we use uh, Grace Abaddon's rules that she applies in 31 A.D., October 23 would also be the Day of Atonement, and April 20th would have been the first day of the first month. And, and May 2nd would have been Passover in 1844. But Grace Amadon doesn't apply those rules in 1844 for some reason. Um, I'm not going to go into her rules on how she figured it out for, for 31 AD and, and why she didn't apply it in 1844. So, okay. So this is a lot of, a lot of information. But the, the thing behind this, all of this... Um, understanding of chronology is that it shows that the Seventh-day Adventist church was led by God in making this prediction that did not come to pass. Because did Jesus come back October 22nd, 1844? We know that he didn't, right? Because we're here and he didn't come back invisibly or anything like that. But the point is they made a prediction for the second coming of Christ and Christ did not come back. But their date was ordained by God. The movement was led by God in making that prediction. And also even in the first prediction on the first day of the first month when Jesus didn't come back then either, that was led by God. We would have to... God allowed him to make that prediction? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first day of the first month, that's that's right in Habakkuk 2, right? That's why they talk call it the tarrying time. Because... Oh, the vision, wait for it. No. Terry, wait for it. No, and White. Come. Yeah. And, and, and Ellen White's comment of, of uh, God had his hand over and hit it, not only from the Adventists, but from their enemies as well. They couldn't see it. Yes. A mistake. Right. And, and that's talking about the first mistake. There, there's a lot more to it than that. But, but yeah, so, so they had, when they made the chart, they believed that the Jewish year 1843 uh, was, um, and, and, and they already understood when they made the chart 
that um, th they already understood the zero year mistake when they made the chart. I don't know if uh, people know that. I thought it was afterwards. Maybe it, well, it's around that time they're figuring it out. So what was the mistake? What was the mistake that God's hand was over? Was it just the 1843, 1844? Or no. I thought it was something else. No, it's just, well, it's just the top right hand corner. When they have 1843 for uh, the end of the 2520 and the, and the 2300. The bottom of the chart is correct where it says 1843 because that's a calculation dealing with uh, the 45 years. That's the 1335 actually that's at the bottom. Uh, 1798 plus 45 equals 1843. That's correct. That's not a mistake. But in the top right hand corner. So what's happening in 1842? So I have a paper on this, um, where I go through these statements, uh, called the Millerites full years versus the no zero year concept. So this is something that I, I looked into because I was completely confused what people were saying. So, we had in this movement uh, people arguing that, uh, and, and I think it was actually um, Dwayne Dewey who had this view that there was no zero year mistake. It was the, called the fullness of the year. And he just had a bit of a misunderstanding about this. So I'm just trying to find when they first talk about this. Okay. So I have all these quotes. I guess I can show you the paper so you can see what I'm looking at. So this is the, the Millerites full year, no zero year. So, so in 1843, they're going to be arguing about it. Yeah, you could be right. It could have been, uh, in 1843 that uh, I don't know why. Yeah, that might be, you might be right. So, so they don't understand it in 1842. Yeah, it's going to be in 1843 that they're going to start now trying to figure this out. So they make the chart. So the chart, they, they still believe, and that makes sense. So they still believe that, you know, we just count from BC to AD and we just, we just do the math, but the math has a zero, but BC to AD is an ordinal count and it doesn't have a zero between it. So there's, there's no zero year, right? Now they, when they notice this, they don't just address the f fact that there's no zero year in a direct way. You'll never see them talk about that. What they recognize is that if we counted a full year from one, from January 1st, 1 BC, it's, it's going to, it's going to bring us to uh, January 1st, 1 AD, right? So that's kind of how they recognize it. But they don't talk about the fact that there's no zero year. They never mention that. But it is the same thing. And what this allows them to do is to not change the chart. So instead of saying, oh, we made a mistake with the chart, and we're just going to list it as 1844, you know, cross out 1843 and put 1844, they didn't just do that. And there's a reason why. So one of the problems that they had was the 70 weeks. So the 70 weeks, well, you can start those in 457, but they had Jesus crucified in 33 AD, 490 years after the decree is given. But they would have to move that to 34 AD, and Jesus isn't crucified in 34 AD. So they, they were trying to work this out. How do we understand this? And uh, so the way that they did it is they just said, well, we're, we're, we're going to start from the spring of 457, and that's going to spring us to the spring of 1844. But they didn't really know what to do with the 70 weeks. So, so they had some problems, and it's really going to be Samuel Snow that sorts this out, because when he finds the midst of the week, it resolves that problem. They don't need to worry about the fact that the 70 weeks ends in 34 AD because Christ isn't crucified at the end of the 70 weeks. He's crucified in the midst of the 70th week. I know that's a, a, a long explanation. And, and we will look at this more when we go into the week of Christ study. 
But anyway, so it's so what happens after 1842? So that's right. It's in 1843 that in um, the signs of the times that they're going to start uh, discussing this issue. Right. They're going to try to understand, you know, when Christ is coming back. When does the 2300 days end? How do we calculate that? And so they're going to continue to refine it. So if they believe that the decree, the going forth of the commandment was in the spring, then there would be 2300 full years in the spring of 1844. Now, Samuel Snow says, well, the commandment didn't go forward in the spring. It went forward in the fall. And so uh, and that's going to be in his uh, uh, this what you see in front of here front of you here this uh uh february 16th um 1844 letter that's published in the midnight cry and republished on passover in um in the signs of the times but uh so he says the 2300 days of daniel 8 began with the 70 weeks in 457 bc but they did not begin with the first day of that year it is true that ezra began to go up from babylon on the first day of the first month but this was not in the year B.C. 457, but in the year B.C. 456. Now, he's he's wrong here. So there's all kinds of problems that in this article, his first article that he gets wrong because it's not in 456. Um, and then he's going to correct some of these mistakes in the true midnight cry. But but the point is, is he's trying to understand this. They're trying to understand these this chronology. At that time, we are going to look at at Samuel Snow's letters next week. But just to finish off some of this here, because I don't want to go through the letters right now. It's 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 uh, too confusing uh, to do very quickly. I want to do that very, very slowly. But what we do have is we have this first day of the first month and we have the first day of the fifth month. So we have we have. Um, August 15th, but now we have this fifth day of the fourth month. And what I want to show you here is going back to this chart that we went through last week. So we have those dates, but we also have the 107 days from the 12th day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month and the two periods of 54 days. So the one thing that that I noticed is that this symbolizes midnight in Millerite history, right? Because uh, the fifth day of the fourth month is when Samuel Snow is going to uh, present uh, the midnight cry at Boston, right? It's going to be July 21st. And and we see this here uh, as a doubling. There's two periods of 54 days. One's cardinal, one's inclusive. And we have Pentecost as the center, right? And and that's going to be a period of 107 days just as a cardinal count. Now, we don't have the 12th day of the first month marked in um, Millerite history, but we do have Pentecost marked in Samuel Snow's letters. So we'll look at that next week. But can we see that the 10th day of the seventh month and the fifth day of the fourth month are symbolized in this chiasm? Right. And we're going to have that chiasm in Millerite history with the fifth day of the fourth month as the center of a chiasm. So this, this chiastic structure of this chronology here in 457 is going to be repeated in Millerite history with these same symbols, the fifth day of the fourth month and the 10th day of the seventh month. Does that make sense? Anybody have questions on that? Because as we look at each of these details that show up in 457 BC that relate to 1844, it's very strong evidence uh, for this um, decree of, of Artaxerxes, his first one, to be the start of the 2300 days, not just the 70 weeks, right? But we can see also the Pentecost symbol is going to tie us to the 70 weeks because Christ is going to be crucified in the midst of the week. He spends 40 days with the disciples. And then 10 days after he ascends into heaven, on the 50th day, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out and he's going to begin his work 
in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That's going to be the, the inauguration of his work is going to happen 10 days after his ascension. And uh, that becomes an important detail later on. So, so these truths are unfolding to us at this time. You know, in 2016, we're starting to understand uh, midnight and the symbols attached to it, that it attaches to Ezekiel. But we're also going to then, in 2017, we're going to understand Samuel Snow's letters. And without this understanding, we could not have understood Samuel Snow's letters. We, we need these chiastic structures in, in order to understand them. And we need to know their origins, that, that these are, are something that are founded in Bible prophecy, in the story of Joseph, in the story of Jacob, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the story of the Exodus, going back to uh, the time of Abraham, we're going to have that 430-year chiasm. So each of these... What? I had a question. Uh, one of the charts here has 140 days between the first day, fifth month, and the 20th day, ninth month. Mm-hmm. Good question. So, you get 130 so, day, yeah, 130 days on that chart. Yeah. So the reason why I put 138 here, because that's the actual number of days, because some of the months have 29 and some have 30. I got you. Right? But if you if you put 140 and 70 and 70, it, you would still have the 10th day of the seventh month as the center. So, so if you wanted to do just a simple calculation, you say, well, you know, if you count from the first day of the first month to the, to the 20th day of the ninth month, uh, how many days is it? You'd say, well, that's going to be, okay, um, I'm, I'm on the first month and I'm going to have four months of, of 30 days. So that's going to be 120. And then I'm going to have 20 days and that's going to be another 20. So that would be 140. Right. And then you say, well, if you're going to count halfway through, you're going to have two months and 10 days. Right. So you start on the first day of the fifth month. You count two months. That's going to bring you to uh, the end of the sixth month and then 10 more days to the 10th day of the seventh month. So it's just easier math to use the 140 and the 70. It still gives you the 10th day of the seventh month as the center. Right. Right. Okay. So I've done both ways. But this one, this one's more precise as far as the days are concerned. And, and same when you look from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month for the divorce, it's 88 days, right? That's, that's just the plain cardinal count because two of those months, a, a Tevet and an Adar are going to have 29 days and Shevet's going to have 38 days or 30 days, pardon me. So you add 29 and 29. You get 58, and then you add the 30 from Shevet, and that's going to be 88. So 29 plus 29 plus 30 is 88 days. But, you know, if you counted it as 30 days months, it would be 90 days, right? So 90 days can work as a symbol. 70 days can work as a symbol. Originally, when Jeff counted from the first day of the first month uh, to the first day of the fifth month, he counted um, – uh, he counted 120 days, right? Now you can see here, you know, it would be like 100 and, um, 118 days. You count from the first day of the 12th month. And, you know, yeah, that together, 118 days. Um, and then he's going to count 70 days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month because he thinks there's 30 days in a month. And, and he, he's going to use the 12 and the 70 to represent what? Like the 120 and the 70 to represent what? So he's going to say it's 190 days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And he divides it as 120 and 70. And what does that represent? What, what is he going to connect it to? Well, you have uh, the 12 loaves in the uh, tabernacle. Yeah. Then the seven branch candlestick. You have this here, twelve seven correlation. Yeah. Christ sends yeah. out the twelve disciples and the seventy disciples. Yeah. So it's yeah, priests and, priest and Levites. Priests and Levites. 
right? And also, you know that uh, a metonic cycle is 19 years, where 12 you have 12 regular years, or, and then uh, and then uh, seven uh, embolismic or leap years, right? So this 12 and seven show up all the time, right? Yes. In, in in these things, you have 12 baskets from feeding the 5,000. And then seven yeah. baskets from feeding yeah. four thousand. Yeah. So so God uses these symbols twelve and seven. And of course we know twelve twelve and seven are on the eighteen forty three chart in the top right hand corner. Twelve times seven is eighty four times thirty is twenty five twenty. They come to two Elam, there's like uh was it twelve wells and seventy palm trees? Something like that, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so so anyway. You know, we're going to look more at Samuel Snow's letters, but I just wanted to show you these connections between 457 and 1844. Now, these are things, some of them, you know, that you can show if you if you simplify it enough and you leave out a lot of these other sort of distractions that I present here uh, to a, to a regular Adventist who's open to looking at new things. Because some people, if they see something new, they're scared, Right. But if, if if you can find somebody who's not going to be scared to look at something new, uh, these are very convincing ideas to show that here's something we found that, uh, and you don't even need to, you know, to, to present it as, as you try to present it as to create the least amount of prejudice as possible. So you just, you know, just doing a study on the 2300 days or something or the 70 weeks and you start showing what happened in Ezra 7 to 10. And, you know, the first day of the first month, and you say how that connects to 1844. People are very convinced by this, Adventists are, when they're open to look at it. Many won't even look at it, you know. They stop their ears and they run screaming. So um, you have to find somebody who's willing uh, to listen to you, which means somebody you need to build a relationship with, uh, that they, they're they even going to listen to you. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Let's uh, close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here uh, this morning. And we just pray for your continued presence throughout this Sabbath. Help us to trust in you in all things. And um, we pray for your angels' care and protection for our loved ones. And we ask that you can, uh, through your spirit, bring the power of conviction that we can truly be converted and that uh, we can draw others to us. Forgive us the way that we sometimes communicate with each other. Um, we know, Lord, that we need to be more like Jesus. And I pray for everyone studying these things, that you can bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.